Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Coney. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics and the presenter of tonight's um, installment of the Public Art Fund Talks at the New School, tonight with Susan Phillips. Uh, we're delighted to be working and to have worked with the Public Art Fund for many, many years. The talks usually take place in this auditorium, which has, a, um, has been praised for its uh, wonderful proportions, its uh, architectural significance, and I think tonight we'll also um, perhaps be uh, drawn to the acoustic qualities of this um, historic space, which was built in 1931. Um, I, before I ask Andrea Hickey, the Associate Curator of the Public Art Fund, to introduce Susan uh, Phillips, I want to quickly explain these name tags, which are also an artist project. They were commissioned from Paul Ramirez Jonas on occasion of the Verlis Center's 20th anniversary. We invited uh, Paul to come and do a project with our archive. He spent several weeks, or several days, I should say, going through several boxes, and then decided the most appropriate way to celebrate a organization that organizes public events would be to bring audience members and speakers into the same public space on the same terms. So you are encouraged to claim a name or identi identify yourself as the person you are, just as Susan Phillips is the featured speaker today and will meet in this um, historic auditorium. So without further ado, Andrea, would you please come up and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to the second uh, installment of our spring series of Public Art Fund Talks. Um, I'd like to start off by first extending our thanks to Karen Coney, Pam Tillis, and the team here at the New School. As Karen mentioned, it's a fantastic partnership, and we're so happy to uh, be able to continue here. Um, and also thanks to the many in generous in uh, individuals who support this series and uh, make our Public Art Fund Talks possible. Um, the Public Art Fund Talks series showcases some of the most dynamic and innovative artists engaging with issues of public practice. We host three talks each semester, and here um, our talks this semester showcase artists whose works transform the boundaries of objects and space in the public realm. And on May 8th, we have the pleasure of welcoming Ugo Rondanone, whose extraordinary site-specific project, Human Nature, opens uh, this April 22nd at Rockefeller Center. So please keep your eye out for that if you haven't seen the announcement already. Um, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Phillips for her first uh, public art lecture here in New York. Um, I first had the pleasure of getting to know Susan on a wintry night in Minneapolis over an evening of piano bar karaoke, uh, which was, if you, as you'll soon hear, a perfect way to get to know Susan. Um, her diverse sound installations often incorporate her own voice. She sings pop songs, folk songs, very softly in an untrained, almost amateur kind of voice, which you'll hear during her talk. Um, and that voice transforms public spaces, um, making unexpected uh, sort of everyday places like a parking lot, a train station, a bridge, um, even the pathways along a riverbed become alive with new memories, new associations that are both personal and universal, which to us is actually the most successful kind of public engagement, bringing in people from all different subjectivities to really have their own experience of a public space. So we're very pleased to be able to hear more about Susan's work tonight. Um, Susan has been the subject of numerous exhibitions, including solo presentations at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Glasgow International Festival, the Institute of Contemporary Arts London, Modern Art Oxford, among many others. She's also had significant presentations in group exhibitions such as Documenta 13, the Edinburgh Art Festival, the 29th Sao Paulo Biennial, the Carnegie International, the Sydney Biennial, and Sculpture Park Munster, among many others. Um, 
In 2010, Susan was awarded the Turner Prize, making her the first sound artist to be nominated and the first to win. And most recently, as Susan will mention tonight, she's been commissioned for a permanent installation at Governor's Island in New York, titled Day is Done, which will be the first work in an ongoing public art program, opening with the new park and public spaces in 2013. So please join me in welcoming Susan Phillips. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Well, it's really nice to be here. Thanks a lot for coming out for the talk. Um, well, I thought before I start to show a few, um, I was going to talk about a few projects, some recent, some not so recent. But before I do, I thought I'd say a little bit about my background, um, you know, where I studied and how I happened to be working with sound today. Um, well, first off, I, st I started, uh, I studied in uh, Dundee, Duncan and Jordanston College of Art, and specialised in sculpture. But then when I went, went to Belfast to do my MA, that's when I really started thinking about sound in a sculptural way. Um, and, I'd, and I'd always liked singing, even you know, as a kid, I was in a choir and everything. But I really started thinking about the physicality of, of singing and what happens when you, when you project your voice out into a space. And then, you know, the sort of thinking about the architectural concerns of sound. And, um, and also, I started thinking about song and the, the psychological and the emotive effects of, of song and how that, you know, song can be like a trigger for memory. So those, so those things were, began to be um, of interest. And then, and then a big, so I suppose the concerns within my work today are, you know, I'm interested in how, you know, like how sound, the architectural concerns of sound and also the psychological effects and how, how sound can heighten your sense of yourself in space. But I'll talk a little bit about that later on when I show you some of the works. Um, so once I graduated from my ME in Belfast, I got involved in the art scene there, and um, I got involved in this artist-run gallery called Catalyst Arts, and we, I was curating exhibitions. And then once I finished with them, because it was a two-year rotating committee, I set up my own organisation called Grassino Productions, and it was like a a base for artists, or initially it was just me, you know, that was a name that I called myself, and then it became like a base for artists who didn't really have a studio-based practice. And then um, I, I began to curate exhibitions uh, with other artists in, in public space in Belfast. So uh, but then um, I got offered, the, I, I won the PS1 studio res residency here in New York, and that brought me here in 2000. And I spent a fantastic year here. And um, yeah, and then I moved to Berlin from there. So I never went back to Belfast, or, but I'm actually from Glasgow, now living in Berlin. So um, yeah, so I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna start with a, a live performance that I did. It's the only live performance I've ever done. I don't usually do live performance. Um, but I thought I would, I would start with this because it does kind of sum up uh, all those concerns I just talked about that, it's, uh, that are in, in, my, in all of my works, and, um, and it's called uh, Metropola. It was originally uh, performed in Tesco Metro supermarket for Beck's Futures Award in 2004, and we restaged it for this uh, uh, documentary for BBC. So I'm going to play that now. whose sound pieces explore the way that song can trigger memory. She recently staged a performance which involved her singing into the public address system of a Tesco supermarket. Who loves the sun? Who cares that it is shining? Who cares what it does since you broke my heart? Thank 
Supermarkets, you're not really expecting to hear a disembodied voice other than someone making an announcement about the discount on the frozen peas or whatever, or music. So to hear someone sing melancholy pop songs, all with the similar themes of longing, escapism, and sung in the first person through the PA system, it was quite disarming for people. They kind of stopped, and you could really, there was a discernible no, uh, dip in the, in the ambient sounds of the supermarket and people weren't sure whether, you know, they almost felt like they were eavesdropping in something quite private. So so I think, so that's what I was trying to, when I was saying before, like, uh, you become very aware of your environment. You're not really that aware of who you're standing next to in, in line in the supermarket, but then all of a sudden you become very aware of the, the space that you're in. So um, the next slide. So this takes us up to 2007. This is a, a, an exhibition called the Munster Sculpture Project, and it happens in Munster every 10 years. And uh, so I was really delighted to be asked to be in it because it's a really prestigious show. And um, so I was asked to come to Munster and find a site. Uh, so. So I, I went there, and uh, when I look for a site, I, I'm you know usually looking for a place that has, you know, maybe a particular acoustic or atmosphere or history, or interest in architecture. So I had a look. They gave me a map and a bike, and I was just you know left to go and find it on my own, and uh, and I couldn't really find anything until. Uh, but I was drawn to the lake, which is in the heart of this, the centre. So I cycled around the lake until I came to this bridge. And uh, you know bridges, when you're under a bridge, everything changes, like the, it becomes darker and the, you know, the, the atmosphere changes and the acoustics are resonant. And uh, so I stopped and I, I, I gazed across the bridge uh, to the other side and there were people looking back at me and it was almost like I was looking into a mirror um, from the, a similar kind of a standing place, you know, that was like, and also the, 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 the structure of the bridge looked like it was being doubled, and as you can see from the image, so, so I thought that was interesting, and then um, this, as I was, I, was, I, I was looking across the water, I started uh, thinking about this barcarolle, this boat song that I knew as a, as a kid, I learned it in, in, in school, and um, and I knew that it was a song about two people singing across water to one another, but I didn't really know anything more than that. And so I decided to go and research the song, and it, it turned out it was written by this uh, German composer called um, Jacques Offenbach, and uh, it was featured in this operetta called, called The Tales of Hoffmann, after E.T. Hoffmann, another very famous uh, German writer. And you probably are familiar with some of the things he's written, like the Sandman, and he was really interested in the doppelganger and, and his writings. And so, so I thought, okay, I want to work with this Sparkerall. Um, so that led me to um, this, the Paul Pressburger adaptation of the Bark uh, of uh, the Tales of Hoff Hoffman, and it's an amazing film if you've never seen it. It's uh, it was actually Scorsese's favourite film. Uh, Anyway, the Tales of Hoffman opens with... There's, it, the Tales of Hoffman are basically three tales, and one of the tales is The Lost Reflection, which is about uh, Julieta. And uh, Julieta's on the right-hand side here, and she's like this evil courtesan who is... Um, she's out in her gondola, and she catches sight of her own reflection, and her reflection begins to sing to her, so they have a duet together. So she has a duet with her, herself, and then goes on later to seduce Hoffman and uh, steal his soul by stealing his own reflection through the, this enchanted mirror. So, so for, for the rest of the, the story, he's trying to find his reflection. And um, so what I did was <clears throat> I recorded myself um, sing the Barcarolle 
both the, the soprano and the mezzo-soprano parts and then have them installed underneath the bridge. And the bridge is like 250 metres wide. And uh, I proposed this to the, you know, the technicians who were working in Munster and they were pretty sceptical that it would work because they thought, how are you going to hear it on the other side? It's too far away, you know. And I was sure that, you know, with the, the acoustics of the underside of the bridge and, with, and I knew that sound would travel, tra travels over water, that you would, it would be heard even if it was dis distant. So we did a test and, and, it, and it did work. So, so I was relieved. Um, And so this is, these are the either side of the bridges. You can see it is, very, it is like a sort of doubling. Um, so I'm, do, I'm going to play a very short video of the, of the work. Yeah, so that was the lost reflection, and I'm clearly clearly not a trained singer. I mean, I can sing okay, but I mean, I, I don't like to. When I record my voice, I don't ever try and clean it up or add any reverb. Or I always like to keep the recording dry, so that because I think everybody can identify with the human voice, but more of a, a voice that isn't sort of heavily produced. Because usually, when you hear a mediated voice, it's with with music, and and it's um, so I like to keep it very dry. Um, and, and now the, the work was um, acquired by the city and it's there for forever now. It's a permanent, permanently installed, but only on a Sunday every hour. <laughs> and uh, some people have say, said to me that they, they go down there. If they, well, this one, one woman said, oh, I went there when I had a row with my husband and I felt so much better. And then another person said, oh, I, stop, I stop here on my way to work every day. And, you know, so I had such good feedback about this work. Um, you know. So this, this is a work I did in 2010 called You're Not Alone, and um, it's in Oxford. I was invited by Modern Art Oxford to come and have a look at this um, Radcliffe Observatory. And it's a really beautiful space. I mean, it's, but it's sadly, it was a bit of a white elephant. 
Um, it was it was built uh, as an observatory um, to observe the transit of Venus, but but they, they decided to, to move everything out because due to uh, poor visibility and take everything, all their telescopes elsewhere. And uh, so it was like, um, yeah, a bit of a folly. So. And then over time, all these buildings were built up around it. So most half the people in Oxford didn't, don't know it exists. Um, so when I went to see it, uh, it looked like it fallen out of the sky. Well, and because up, up until recently, there was this huge, uh, the Radcliffe Infirmary that obscured it from view, but then they tore it down. So then you could see it in all its splendor. You can just see it on the left-hand side. And it was, it was modeled on this, um, the Tower of the Winds, this first century B BC clock tower in Athens. And I, I thought that was really interesting because I was just imagining like this, these winds mo you know, moving through the portals of, the, of this tower. And then the fact that it was a, an observatory, I, I thought that was like, there was a, lot to, it was a lot to go on. As you can see from this uh, Stuart and Revit architectural drawing, the f there's all these personified winds on, on the facade of, of the, the, the original tower. So um, also in, in Oxford, there's this huge Marconi collection and Marconi is a, the, the pioneer of radio. So I started thinking about radio because I'd remember that Marconi had once said that when sound is generated, it never actually dies away completely and that it's the, still out there, but however faintly, sort of generating a, through the universe, that idea I found very evocative, you know. So I thought, so it brought me to, to radio and um, I discovered these things called uh, radio interval signals. And it turns out that every radio station had one. Um, it, they had their own personalized radio interval signal generator, as you can see in the image here. And um, so, you know, you, you would have, like, the voice of the people of Ho Chi Minh City would have its own, like, little signature tune. And it, would, it, was, it was so that if you were trying to find that you, that station and there was no program on it, you could tell, tell it what it was like between, between programs. It wasn't just dead space that you were just, just you, know, you were tuning into the right station. You would have this chime. And uh, most of them were like chimes. They were like music boxes, especially the the the, the earlier ones. They were they had a very simple sound to them. Um, so there's there's hundreds of these, and there's a huge archive that I, I looked at uh, of all these radio interval signals, as I say, from all over the world. And um, so I decided to record. Um, different sort of the, more, the vintage ones, the ones that I say they're very simple, at a more kind of um, sort of dissonant and melancholy air feel to them. And, uh, but rather than, I recorded them on a vibraphone, which has a very similar sound to the original, but it creates more of a sense of a deep, deep space. Um, and then what I did was I project, I had the sound transmitted via radio from um, modern Art Oxford's Tower to the Radcliffe Observatory. And uh, that's the, the receiver there in the observatory. So you really got a sense of this, the sound being uh, traveling right across the city to, to uh, the observatory. And you had this feeling of being sort of like inside and outside at the same time. And I'm gonna show you um, a, a, sh a short clip of this video and it's very poor quality, so forgive me.
So I had another um, chance to exhibit the same work in a, an amazing space in Berlin called the Haus der Rungfunk. And um, it, was, it was built in 1931, same as uh, this auditorium. And it was one of the, f the first self-contained broadcasting, ha broadcasting houses in the world. And uh, when Hitler, uh, when the, yeah, the, the NSDAP, the Nazi party came to power, Hitler used it as, as a, uh, to broadcast, you know, his propaganda from there. So it has this very checkered history. And then later, um, later on, um, uh, after the war, it was liberated by the the, the Russian uh, army, and then, even though it was part part of the British sector, the the the, the, Ru the Russian um, the GDR segre segregated it. So it was in West Berlin, but it was still it was still part of Russia. Uh, so this is a, a list of some of the the radio interval signals. Uh, And that's the the house to Rungfunk when it was occupied by uh, the Germans and the Russians. <laughs> and that's uh, the receiver and the transmitter on either sides of this beautiful atrium that you're not normally get, got access to, but they were they allowed us to exhibit the the work there, and they they, they supplied all the equipment, so it was great. <laughs> Okay, so um, the next work is a work uh, called Lowlands, and um, Lowlands is it will it takes its name from the song um, Lowlands Away. It's an old Scottish ballad from uh, the 16th century, uh, really old, and uh, and it's a song about a, a, a sailor who drowns and um, comes back to say a final farewell to his loved one. And uh, and it was originally uh, it was a, a, a ballad, as I said, but then for some reason the, sa the sailors adopted it as a sea sh shanty, and uh, so it, so the song changed, and so I discovered there's three three different versions of it. So what I did was I recorded myself singing these the three different versions, and then have them um, play simultaneously. Uh, and I found a p the perfect s site for it was the three bridges that cross the Clyde in Glasgow. Because for, for me, when I think of lowlands, I think of the lowlands of Scotland. But, uh, but in actual fact, the song is like the lowlands drow drowning in the windy lowlands. So it's like they're talking about the sea. So uh, I, th I, th I thought that was a very sort of um, interesting and evocative sort of um, image. So... Um, yeah, I always loved these bridges because they're right in the heart of the city and they're, they're very close proximity to one another and they, they say so much about the vernacular of the city. But then when you go underneath the bridges, which not many people do because it's a little dark and, you know, there's, you know, drug uh, users and different sort of people with, you know, you can, well, you can imagine... But, uh, so, but you go down, it's like the dark underbelly of the city. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to install lowlands here. And I, I noticed that um, <clears throat> that were flowers tied to the railings of, of the uh, the bridge underneath. And it, it, it turned out it's a, a common, place for, common place for people to commit suicide. And it was only up until quite recently that they employed a, a man to to trawl the, the, the river for bodies. And that was his, his like full-time job. Um, so this is an aerial view. So you can see that the three bridges are really close to one another. And uh, so I installed each of the three versions underneath, underneath each of the three bridges. And as I said, they all played simultaneously. And then um, the, the, the words sort of came together in the main refrain and then would sort of come apart again uh, or, or, or m mingle with the other words. So there were, yeah, it's, it depended on where you st stood, you could hear one song clearly over the other or you, hear, you just heard them all together. 
So it's actually quite a beautiful space, I think, um, under there. So I was going to sh uh, show a, a clip from a video of the work. So that was uh, Glasgow, uh, Glasgow International invited me to do something uh, for their festival. Uh, so, so, and that was the work that actually got me nominated for the Turner Prize. Um, so that was great. But it was it was interesting when we were, we were doing the sound test. Immediately, this this man appears and he said, oh, "What's that? What's that about?" And, I told him it was about, um, you know, the, the song. The word, the song is about someone who'd been drowned, and and he, you know, he said, oh, I saw someone drown here on the way to work. They threw themselves in the water. No one, he didn't. We tried to rescue him, and he was really, really upset. But so it was, it was quite interesting to get all this, the local uh, history um, that added to the work. I felt uh, stories from the locals, you know. And then this, this other guy appears, and he's like, uh, he was drunk, and he had a bottle of. Buckfast or something, and he was like, "Can you hear some kind of voices?" <laughs> Very funny. Um, so, so yeah. So the so this is this image here is a uh, London uh, the Stock Exchange. I was asked by Art Angel. They're a, a, a like. A, the Public Art Fund here, the, the Commission Art and Public Space in London, and they invited me to, to do something. So, and they're great, so I was really, really happy about that. And then, of course, I've been to London a million times, but, because I'm from, from the UK, but uh, I'd never been in the city with a view to finding a, a location to exhibit in a public space. So, I went to London with fresh eyes, and I happened to go at the weekend, and um, and I thought I would, he you know, head for the the city, the, the financial district, because that's where all the sort of interest in architecture is. But then I I hadn't realised that everything w it was closed because you know there's there's all, everybody goes home then, and all the offices close, and all the cafes and all the bars close. So it was really eerie. It was like it'd been evacuated, you know. So. So I was thinking about that, you know, the, the absence of the, of the people. And um, so I was wandering around the streets of, of the financial district, which used to be the, the, the I mean, the financial district is the epicenter of the old walled city of, of London. And uh, 
and you can still see traces of the old wall uh, there. So I started researching in the 16th century, uh, like when, when the old wall, when it was an old walled city, and discovered Thomas Ravenscroft, and he was this composer who who was really enth enthused by the, the street traders' cries, as many people were at that time, like Shakespeare often wrote about them and, uh, and other composers. But Thomas Ravenscroft wrote these incredible canons, like rounds, um, where he used the, the real uh, street trader, traders' cries, not the idealised ones, which the, so that's why I really liked his ones. And, um, and he compiled this compendium of, of uh, rounds. And um, so, yeah, so I started looking at Thomas Ravenscroft and thinking about this, of, of working with rounds and, uh, and, and then looking at other, other stuff from the 16th century and, uh, and realized that a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the composers of that time where everything was kind of talking about water in some way, like tears or fluidity, immersion, circulation. So that became a kind of theme for, for, the, for the work, uh, Surround Me, a song cite, cycle for the city of London. And basically what it was was six interrelated sound installations where you could walk to, you all could, it was all within walking distance. And I invited people into the city uh, to hear it at, just at the weekends. I mean, normally, um, I mean, I quite, I like, I enjoy when people just happen upon my work unexpectedly and there's this element of surprise or, you know, but I think um, for this, in this instance, there were, we provided maps and people came into the, the city uh, financial district, especially to hear the work. And uh, this this drawing that you see here uh, was also from 1609, at the same time as Thomas Ravenscroft's uh, City Rounds. And uh, he, this is a, a sort of a, a, an illustration of the, the mind as a as a, a walled city. And on the right is the sort of gate of hearing. So I was looking at all this kind of stuff, and then so the, so this is an aerial view of all all of the, all of the six locations. Uh, and right at the heart of the of the that circle, there is the finance, is the the Bank of England and the Stock Exchange, which is where the old all the trading used to take place when it was an old walled city. So this place, it, this uh, change alley, it's it's just off the the uh, it's a bank, and it's just off the the Bank of England and the Stock Exchange, but this is where the real um, trading took place apparently and where the, and they see in the coffee houses and they say that this is where the the first bubble burst when they were speculating in the in the southeast uh, indies um, and uh, Jonathan Swift um, describes or he's written this poem about it I'm just going to read, read, read a little bit of it but he says uh, there is a gulf where thousands fell here all the bold adventurers came a narrow sound, though deep as hell, change alley is its dreadful name. Nine times a day it ebbs and flows, yet he that on the surface lies, without a pilot, seldom knows the time it falls or when it will rise. So I think it's interesting he has all these like metaphors for, of, of water because bank, the actual place bank where the ba Bank of England and the Stock Exchange is, is it isn't talking about the, the bank, it's talking about the river bank. So when you think about all these words that are like, you know, like cu currency and cash flow and uh, there was other ones that I, that I thought of, but I can't remember them now, but I thought that was interesting. But, um, anyway, I'm going to show you, this is a very short video of... A Thomas Ra me singing a Thomas Ravenscroft round called New Oysters, and it's about the simple trading of, trading of oysters. But 
just as I want to be made peace. Let the great for time of such peace meet her by the Yeah, so that was the uh, Change Alley. Now, this this is Milk Street, and as you can see, it's a very different looking uh, site from the other one. It's a very corporate feel to it with all its glass and steel. And this was, was the site for Lacrimae, uh, which was by John Dowland, and he was like a rock star of his time, and he, he wrote this Lacrimae, or also known as Seven Tears for vials and the, so what, what I've done is rec I recorded a violin player play each of the, the tones, the seven tones separately and then had the, the speakers installed in the facade of the, the building that you just saw. And um, so each tone is played separately but I got them to play it seven times over so the note, the tones were sort of coming in, in and out of sync so it didn't really sound like the original version when it's all kind of fragmented like that. Um, so this is the music and you can see that the, the way they, they used to read the music so you could actually stand in a, in a circle and, uh, and, and read it together. So I'm just going to play a little bit of the lacrimae in Milk Street. I think this is my favourite location out of all six. This is the uh, Moorfields High Walkway. And uh, this, this used to be offices and um, 
but it looked like it had been abandoned overnight. They still had curtains up and some plants in the window and, and stuff, but they, it was un totally unoccupied. And it's right, it's right in the heart of the city centre, so it's kind of strange. It's like this post-apocalyptic feel about it. So um, this was the site I chose for John Bennett's uh, Weep On oh Mine Eyes. As I said, all the songs that I seem to discover were all kind of to do with crying. You know, I think I suppose it, there was a lot to cry about then, given they had the plague and then the Great Fire of London. But anyway, this this is a this is Weep on My Eyes, and it, um, it's a madrigal. And madrigals came from Italy, and they, they were really popular in, in, in England in the 16th century. And uh, the, the way that you sing it, it's to sort of create the illusion that you don't actually have to draw breath when you sing you know so as if you know like if you were um like a heavenly body that didn't need to breathe you know so that was the that was what the idea was with the layering of the voices but uh yeah so i'll play it. it's very short Yeah, so I, uh, I installed each of the speakers in the four corners of the of the square, and I sang all of the, the 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 soprano, the bass, the tenor, and the alto parts. And I don't I don't read music, so I had to I had to learn it all by ear, and it was really a, a real challenge. And I got laryngitis from doing it. It was it was really difficult, but um, I got there in the end, I think. But, um, yeah, so I was really glad to include London Bridge in the project because I, in, the, in my research I discovered that how important that it was to the the early more modern city. So this was the site for John Dowland's uh, "Flow My Tears," and you know I mentioned him earlier that he did the the seven the seven tears, but this time he put it to 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 words, and so. I, I I sang the this the slow voice under the under the bridge and uh, but I'm not going to play that because I think I don't want to run out of time. So I'm going to skip this video. Yeah. Okay. So this brings us up to, to very recent. Uh, this was in Edinburgh last year. Edinburgh Arts Festival asked me to 
to do a, a new commission for them. So <laughs> I went to Edinburgh. I mean, I'm from Glasgow, and but I, I'm actually not that familiar with Edinburgh, and they were really surprised at that. And um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I got I got there, and so the first thing I did was go up to the highest point, and which was Cal Calton Hill. So I got up to the top of Calton Hill, and um, and I'm having a look around, and I can I'd forgotten how close to the sea it was, and it was really really, really struck me, and, and they have a really strong connection to the sea. And so then I was um, I noticed this uh, ball from this Nelson's monument that's on Calton Hill, and it. Um, and it was being hoisted up this uh, spire, and then it was dropped at one o'clock. At the same time, this gunfire went off. And uh, so it turned out that that was to show the sailors that uh, it was one o'clock, so that they could set their chronometers, because before they had the, the ball, they would have to bring the chronometers on shore up to the obse uh, observatory and, and, and set them there, and it was a lot of hassle. But then, because it's Scotland, you know, it's, it's, you don't it, often it's kind of foggy and stuff, so they thought they would introduce this one o'clock gun as well. So at the same time, there was a gun fired from the Edinburgh Castle. And, I, and apparently, I didn't even know that, but um, anyway, every, every day at one o'clock, this gun's fired. I mean, obviously, they don't need to set their chronometers by looking at the the ball or listening to the gun anymore, but they still do it out of tradition. And, uh, yeah, so this is the gun from Edinburgh Castle. And then what you see on the right is uh, a time gun map, so you could uh, see how far away you'd have to be, you'd be to hear the gun. So I decided... Uh, so then so I started doing a bit more research um, and discovered this guy, uh, John Robinson. And he was an inventor and a mathematician. And he invented this, uh, it was like a component part for a, a church organ. Um, and uh, I mean, he basically invented the first siren. And uh, just to say, this guy Tyndall describes Robinson's work as follows, a stopcock was so constructed that it opened and shut the passage of a pipe 720 times in a second. The apparatus was fitted to the wind chest of an organ. The sound G and alt was most smoothly uttered, equal in sweetness to a dear female voice. When the sound was reduced to 360, the sound was more mellow than any man's voice of the same pitch. So, <clears throat> So he, he decided to call it Siren after the mythological Siren. And uh, so I thought, so what I decided to do was, um, in the key of G, record my own voice in a, in a triad of voices and have it triggered every day at one o'clock along with the gun and the, the, the ball dropping. So it was a very brief intervention that cut through the city uh, from from all, from six different points. So it sort of kind of created a, an invisible line of sound right from Carlton Hill right down through the Carlton Cemetery across Prince's Gardens, um, through the Scottish galleries to the to the castle, and uh, it was slightly staggered. So it kind of had created a kind of domino effect, so you got the sense of the sound really moving through the city. And I'm going to play, play another video, very short.
So, um, as I said, it was three different uh, harmonising tones, uh, and that's how, when you hear a, si a siren or a horn from a, a ship, it's usually three harmonising tones. So, if, depending on where you were standing, sometimes it really did sound like a, a horn from a, a train or something. Someone asked me, is that a ship? I could hear someone say, is that a, a train? You know, when it, when it sounded. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I've, I've got a voice like a foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this brings me to a work that I did for Documenta um, in Castle uh, that, that, oh, oh, that was last year, opened last year. And uh, the, this is me out on the tracks because um, I was doing a site visit and we had to wear those because it was a bit dangerous. But, um, but yeah, like I say, when I'm looking for a site, um, you know, this was the very last place I looked at, and I, again, I couldn't find anything that I, I liked, and they kept showing me different places. And, and but then, as soon as I walked into the train station, I thought, no, this is it. This is it. This is the place I want to show in. And I didn't really know anything about its history, but I just felt it had the right kind of atmosphere. And uh, but it was really only when I walked right out to the end of the platform that I sort of thought, yeah, I can imagine the sound coming towards you from a distance and I would really like to use this have this deep use the deep space of the um that seemed to go on forever you know that it's great vista of the of the hills and everything but what I didn't know at that time was the just if I was able to follow the tracks around uh, you would come to um Henschel and Sons uh factory where they used to build Tiger 1 and Tiger 2 uh, tanks during the war and it was forced labor camp and um, I mean it still exists today but they don't it's not, they're not building tanks anymore um, but, but originally they built trains so it's absolutely huge so huge that you could from an aerial view you can see that trains could actually drive into it so yeah so it, Castle happened, I didn't know this either, that it was one of the the, busy, the biggest Nazi towns in, in Germany because of its, um, and it was heavily bombed during the war because of uh, the, the factory. And uh, and it was one of the places, This the train station uh, where, I decided, where I showed the work in was where the, one of the main deportations of the Jews during the, the war. And uh, and that's the platform where I exhibited in. Yeah, this is the Henschel and Sons where they built the tanks. So one of the, the, the places that you were deported to was this place called Tresenstadt. And I'd, I'd read about it in the, a couple of times in the, the Austerlitz by uh, Sebold was the first time. And he's talking about how he, he's, he, his mother was sent to Tresenstadt and she was an opera singer. And a lot of the the artists were sent to this camp, you know, the, the writers, the, the, the singers, the, the, the artists, the, you know, uh, musicians were sent to this camp. And, um, and uh, one of the people sent there was Pavel Haas. And uh, so Hitler decided to make a propaganda movie for the Red Cross because they were coming to visit it. And he wanted to make a, a sort of a show it as a kind of model camp. So he made this video that you can actually see on YouTube. It's pretty horrific um, when you when you know uh, what it is, you know. So Pavel Haas, while he was in, in, in the camp, wrote this incredible piece called Study for Strings Orchestra and um, and they perform it in, in, the, in the film. Um, Hitler gives the Jews a city, it's called. And you can just see him there on the, at the top. He's, he's listening nervously to the, the performance. Um, he's, not, he's not actually conducting it himself. He's just listening nervously. But then uh, shortly after the film was completed, they, they sent most of them to Auschwitz and they were all killed. But and and the, the score the score was lost. So, but the, the the conductor amazingly survived, and he was able to remember the um, 
he was able to remember the work and he was able to piece it back together again. So, so what I did was I took this study for strings by Pavel Haas and then I got, I worked with a viola player and a cello player and got them to play uh, each of the tones separately. So that, um, so I recorded them play it once with just playing with A and then, and then I recorded it a second time with the, you know, G, G flat and then and so on and so on, until we did all of the notes and they're, they're like 20, 26 notes in the in the piece. So it was a very laborious process to do it like that. But but so what happened when you played it all together? It sounded very different from the original. Also because it wasn't the full orchestra; it was just the cello and the viola to give a sense of the absence of the others. So, so what you get is a completely different, um, very sort of almost a tonal uh, sounding um, uh, piece on, uh, on strings. And so then I mixed it down to an eight channel installation and had the speakers installed out on the, the train tracks themselves. So all the, all the tones were separated. And that's uh, people just gathering to, to listen to the, the sound. Okay, I'm, I'm going to show you a very sh short clip of this. I was thinking about showing you the, the whole thing, but I'll, I'm not. I'm just going to show you a little clip. So um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I think that's us. Yeah. So I hope you've got lots of questions for me. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Susan. That was really fantastic and so special to be able to see so many of your pieces and actually hear them especially for those of us who haven't been able to see so many in person. Um, something I'm very interested in is uh, how you intuitively approach your sites, but then when you begin to research, your intuition proves so evocative. There are these layers that you uncover. It's so fascinating to me that they're, you know, you, you go in with a gut reaction, but then you have this experience of, uh, of layers of research that sort of come together like a constellation. Um, do you find that that's something that happens naturally or you're kind of looking for it or how does that evolve? No, it or? amazes me too. Uh, like recently I've, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I was asked to show in Jaina this, um, for the Schiller University and they've got this incredible garden and they asked me to sh 
show an already existing work. So I went out to have a look and they had these two statues in the garden like uh, that they decided to move closer together so they're facing each other and then and then there are these two huge trees as you enter. And I thought it would be a great site for this piece that I did called The, the Two Sisters. Uh, and it's about a sorricide where one sister kills the other. And anyway, she, her body becomes a, a fiddle. And the, the only song that the fiddle is pl plays is this song that ends up incriminating the sister. So, so anyway, I was thinking about that. But then it turned out that Schiller wrote a play about two sisters, Queen... Queen Elizabeth and her sister Mary, Queen Mary, the Mary Queen of Scots, who I never actually met in real life. Mm. And, uh, and I'd, I'd already decided on the two sisters, but then discovered that in the research, which made it a real perfect location, new, new site, gave it a whole new life, this, this work, this already existing work. So I love when that happens sometimes, you know, you might make it for one particular place and then it takes on a whole new life in another place, and people can't believe it was never made for that. Like the lowlands, you know. Yeah. People think that that was made for that place, but it wasn't. I made it for a gallery in Berlin, you know. So interesting, because we talk a lot about what the difference is between site-specific or site-responsive, but to be able to have an evolution of sites and in the same work is very different and exciting. Um, I don't want to dominate the question. So if everyone um, can raise their hand when they have a question and take a microphone to be recorded for our video, that would be great. Um, Susan, I'm interested in your preference for melancholy in your projects. And I wanted to know, because there's a kind of, hist in so many of them, there's a sort of mining of history but you're bringing that to the present. And can you just talk about that relationship, that sort of continuum between past, present, and the presence of mel melancholy, as opposed to comic ditties or something like that? Yeah, it's amazing how many songs are melancholic. I mean, I mean all those songs that I uncovered in my research for the Surround Me project was, they were all, like I say, about you know, tears. And I think people are just really drawn to uh, sad songs because I think uh, yeah it's, it's like they're, I think people are fascinated by their mort own mortality or something you know so there are so many of them out there and uh, and those are the types of songs that you would sing more when you're on your own so when I when I recorded see the when I've recorded my voice where I sing these melancholy pop songs I'm trying to sing them in a way that doesn't sound like I'm singing to an audience like you might if you were singing more of a like a a happier ditty, or whatever. <laughs> so, and you, uh, you know, and I haven't been known to sing at a party, but I wouldn't choose to sing a sad song, you know. Um, so yeah, so I suppose I want to create a sense of solitude in, in the voice, and uh, like, uh, so you know that it heightens your your own. Yeah, it's like more like the contrast between the private moment and a very public. Con, uh, space, with with like for instance the work that I showed at the beginning, you know the uh, te in Tesco Metro. But yeah, I'm so you so the melancholy songs. Yeah, I'm actually doing a publication at the moment, and there's one of the people. There's it's ten projects, ten essays, ten institutions, and one of the essays is pretty much on melancholia. You know. And um, and in the 16th century, it was really, it was really, there was a whole, there's a, a book on melancholia, and everybody was painting these pictures of cherubs looking as sad on clouds, and that was the sort of the fashion, you know. So, so they, like, I mean, I was drawn to those songs, but not because they were melancholic, but because you know, because it was. That was the fashion in the 16th century, and that's that was the period when the, the old wall was there. But it is true; it does seem to be a sort of um, a thing in my work where I do, I am drawn to those songs.
Thanks so much. Uh, can you talk a little about um, what you're working on next or future projects? Yeah, well, today I did a sound test on Governor's Island, and um, it's going to—it's a permanent sound installation that's going to be launched um, well soon. The date's not fixed yet, and we did just the sort of final. Well, not not final, but one of the, the last sound tests, and, uh, and it went really well, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. And that's, that's called The D Day is Done, and it's been inspired by the, the military taps. It used to be a military island, Governor's Island, and now they've made it in, into this amazing park for the people, and so the sound is going to be uh, triggered an hour before the last boat leaves, so basically it's to sort of say, right, you've got, you've got to start packing up now, time to go. If you hear this, these horns, um, but which are based on these, this, the taps that used to be played every day there. Um, but then, I've, uh, but when you separate the notes again, I've separated the tones out, and you can hear it all over the island. Um, it sounds very much like ship's horns. So it's kind of, you can hear that it's taps, the military tattoo, the taps, but it's also, once we turned it off, we, we heard the, the, the horns of the boats and we thought it was still playing, you know, but it was actually the boats. So I was really pleased about that. So that's, that's, that's uh, one of the things I did today, and that's uh, opening this year. And uh, I'm also in a, 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 a group show in MoMA in July, end of July. Actually, it's a study for strings, so it's going to be in a very different context and a, a solo show in Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, and quite a few muse museum shows coming up. So no, I don't only work in public space, but I, do, you know, I was focusing on public space for this talk, obviously. Um, yeah. Hi. I'm Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, can you speak a bit about like how, if the space changes when your work's there in the lowlands work, when you said that people were committing suicide there a lot, and then did that continue after the work was there? And like that was kind of, that seemed to be quite a, uh, an odd, um, it's, it's also very melancholy, but how do you feel about like being the last sound or, or something to? Well, I would, I would feel really sad if it induced them to suicide. Oh no, no, <laughs> I, yeah. no I didn't. didn't but, really. Yeah, but no, but that that yeah, but no, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that was one of the reasons I thought it fitted there because it is about a drowning. You know, it is about the sailor who drowns and comes back to say a final farewell. And I, I mean, I, I I don't know if anybody's committed suicide since, or I don't think during. I would have heard about it, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's quite common, sadly. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. My question is kind of an adjunct to that and with the same piece. Um, I'm just wondering what your attitude is towards like the transformation of the space after a piece is in there, whether the space has changed. You know, you have all of a sudden people coming to visit lowlands that weren't there. And so now it's not a space where it is so empty all the time, you know. And so there's the, uh, that quality of extracting the nature of the space, but also altering the space after it. And so that what you were drawn to is now different, kind of a Heisenberg, you know, once observed, things change. So just wondering what your attitude is towards that. Did the space change? Well, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, people said, you know, like like in Munster, for instance, I mean, it's quite an ugly, brutal bridge and no one would ever, ever stop really under that bridge. And so they said, oh, you've transformed this ugly place into something magical and things like that, you know. Um, but I think, uh, or you might not look at the architecture, but once it's, once you hear the sound, you're all, all, you, you know, especially if, if it's, um, if you happen upon it, and then all, it's this, uh, all of a sudden you hear it and you're, it's almost like you're, people often tell me as well when they're waiting to, 
waiting to hear the work or they happen upon it unexpectedly. It's like their senses are somehow heightened because of the, the, they've got their waiting in anticipation. Or, so th then you, you, you seem to become very aware of the place you're in and, and you're noticing things about the architecture that you wouldn't have noticed before. That's what I was saying about like defining the, the architecture and at the same time. It's like you're having this kind of simultaneous experience. You've, you're you're kind of grounded in the present moment because you know the like the voice, if I'm using my voice, it's clearly not a trained voice. So you're never and yet and it's and it's often in these very busy built up but you're battling with sounds of traffic and trains and water and the people. So you can never actually be completely taken away by it, you know, as you would if you were listening to a concert or music at home, you know, so you've, you, 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 you're you have a kind of, having a kind of simultaneous experience of being both in the work, but also very aware of your surroundings. Um, yeah. Hey. Yes, uh, here. I've been lucky to experience uh, a few of your installations in Munster and Documenta, <laughs> and it's always interesting, uh, ex in being immersed in them when the the context is usually of a very experimental cutting edge uh, visual art uh, realm and i'm glad that also the museums and galleries are embracing your work i'm curious about the reception that your work has in the music field uh, if they embrace this return this rereading of interpretation of history through this conceptual form or if they if they find resistance to your uh, ignoring maybe uh, contemporary uh, music um, scene? I don't know. I mean, I know there are a lot of um, musicians who would consider themselves like sound artists, you know, in this category, like electroacoustic comp composition. Or, and I don't really fit into that. But, um, so, but I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I've, I did a lecture in, the, in London to a, a sound... Uh, and the, 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 I think people were very happy that I got this Turner Prize uh, because I, I work with sound, but, um, but they're not, I wouldn't say they were necessarily musicians, and I don't, I don't think they would think of me as, as that, you know. But I, don't, I haven't had any hostility from, from them. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more question. I was just wondering, um, I saw the Pavel Haas piece in, at Documenta as well, and what I'm curious about is how you, uh, some of your pieces, is, is a, it's a straightforward rendering of something, and how you think about, like in this case, you broke up the piece or reduced it in a certain way and broke up the music, and, and uh, that's one half of the question. So how you, what, what leads your thinking in that regard, or what motivates you to do that in some cases and not others. And also, if you could talk a little bit about how you use the sound to architecturally to kind of structure, like in that piece it was really notable, the way the speakers were placed and how that created part of the experience. Yeah, I really wanted to work with the study for strings, but it's a very, um, I mean, it's a huge orchestra who are playing it in a, but it's incredible. It sounds like it reminds you of, of trains, you know, the uh, like you're in a train and it sort of gradually builds the momentum and it gets faster and faster. And um, so, I, I, but rather than work with the entire orchestra, I thought if you only work with like two two of the musicians, it gives more space. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't you know, work with it in the same way where you, you with, with tone for tone, you know, and, and have it all fragmented. So what I wanted to create was a sense of, of um, you know, it was like being, uh, because it was forgotten and destroyed and then reassembled. And so I wanted that, yeah, I mean, the, the musicians stayed as true to, they could, to the, the music. They didn't change it in any way, but they just played their parts, you know. So I just wanted to create this ab sense of the absence. And... Um, and also, just spatially, you couldn't have, you can't have two, you know, it would, it would have just been a cacophony if you had, to, you know, it would just 
for that reason too, you know. Thank you, Susan. Please mark your calendars for May 8th for Ugo Randanone's talk. And thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. Thanks for coming.